I'm going to talk about ticks, tick-borne diseases, and One Health, so something that I like to blabber on a lot about, so hopefully I'll stay on time. So today I'm going to give a brief overview of ticks and tick-borne diseases, predominantly from sort of the ecological disease ecology perspective, and then illustrate this with the black-legged tick and Lyme disease, which is probably an example that many of you are familiar with um, because we're dealing with it routinely in Ontario. And then highlight some current research in this topic that's being conducted um, by our lab and colleagues. So I apologize, there's lots of disgusting pictures of ticks in this um, presentation. I don't find them super disgusting, but you might. Um, so if we're thinking about ticks, the key considerations that we can't forget about are thinking about climatic conditions, the habitat in which the tick lives in, and the host which it feeds on. And I'm gonna get into more of this later through our examples. If we think about tick-borne disease, we have a few additional components that need to be thought of when we're thinking about the cycle. So this is a very brief overview. So there's hundreds of tick species worldwide, hundreds of tick-borne pathogens, um, and many different sort of ecological and life cycle factors. In Canada and North America, we're predominantly thinking about three host ticks, which are ticks that feed on a different host in each life cycle, and then spend the majority of their life off host in the environment. And so here we have, if we go to number one, we have ticks, uh, the eggs are being laid. Depending on what pathogen you're dealing with, sometimes pathogens are passed from mum into egg and sometimes they're not. So it's important to kind of understand that factor when you're looking at the disease ecology. Larva, which is sort of the baby stage of the tick, um, will feed on a host, take a blood meal, and during that time, if that's a reservoir host, so some sort of host that can carry a pathogen and the pathogen can survive in it, that larva can become infected. It will then fall off that host, develop into the next life stage, needs to be in a suitable habitat and climate, and then we'll quest again, so look for another uh, host as a nymph, which is the teenager life stage of the tick. Depending on if it acquired a pathogen in the last blood meal, this is another opportunity for it to feed on a host and potentially pick up something. It will fall off again, same um, process, move into the next life stage, and then feed as an adult. And then a lot of times adults will mate on host as well, and so there's a variety of um, things that occur on the final host. I added a few additional things because we need to consider the tick considerations, so the habitat, the host, and the climate. We also need to think about the susceptible species. So in each blood meal, the tick may be picking up a pathogen or transmitting a pathogen. And so depending on the species, some of them might be susceptible to that pathogen and to disease. Some might not, but they might be carrying a whole bunch of things that the, the tick can pick up. And so we need to think about all the considerations related to that host species. And so that host could be a domestic animal, which we worry about domestic animal health a lot. It could also be you or me um, when we think about zoonotic diseases um, and diseases that can affect humans. So that's it very much in a nutshell. So for ticks, if we're thinking about climate, the microclimate is the most important. So that's thinking at the level of the tick. So this is important for survival of the tick on a daily basis, for development, so as it moves through its life stage, and then questing, so when it comes up and it looks for a host for a blood meal. The most important variables, particularly for the ticks that we're considering in North America, are temperature and humidity. Climate is also gonna impact pathogen survival and replication in that host, so another consideration to think about. You've probably heard a lot about tick-borne diseases and climate change, particularly in Canada. This is a map that was developed specifically for the black-legged tick, which we'll get into later. But the reason I like this map is that it shows the changes that can happen with climate change. And we're gonna talk a bit more about that um, in, the in a few slides. But essentially, 
In temperate areas, we're getting warmer. So our, our climate is becoming suitable for these ticks when, they pre when it was previously too cold for them to survive. But we also need to think about what's happening in areas where it has been warm enough or it's quite warm. We might have the climate no longer suitable because it's too hot or too dry. And so this map shows how we can have maybe expanding distribution, but also shifting distribution. So some places might actually become less suitable for ticks and tick-borne diseases, which is favorable, but if you think about the conditions that are leading to that no longer being suitable, it might not be great for people to live in either. Because ticks spend so much of their life stage off of the host, the habitat is really important. And habitat is kind of intricately related to microclimate factors, right? So the, all the vegetation and everything contributes to the, the local temperature and humidity. And so you're going to have some tick species that do really well in forested areas where it's nice and humid, there's lots of vegetation, access to hosts, versus some do really well in sort of drier areas that are, are more grassy, um, and you're exposed to a different um, array of hosts. And so it's very dependent on the tick species. Habitat change is driving some of the patterns that we're seeing in ticks and tick-borne diseases. And so this diagram sort of broadly describes different changes that we might see. So deforestation, obviously if you're wiping out all the forests, maybe replacing it with agricultural area, it's no longer suitable for those forest dwelling ticks, but if it's more grassy, drier, you might have a different tick species that's gonna thrive in that. Reforestation, which we ultimately think is something positive, and I still think it's as positive, um, but reforestation, particularly in the United States, um, is really thought to have led to a resurgence of the black-legged tick, um, which is the one that can transmit Lyme disease. And so although it's ultimately positive to reforest and you know, have good biodiversity, um, this has also created a habitat for the tick species. And then fragmentation is a phenomenon that we're seeing happen a lot in urban and suburban areas where we might still have green space, but it's chopped up into a whole bunch of small spaces. Um, you might have a road that goes through a forest. And so the, the species that can survive in that area and the climate, um, the, the microclimate, it changes, right? Because we've, it's no longer this big continuous forest. We're thinking about these small little patches. And with that, we've seen changes in what tick species can survive there, what hosts live there, and therefore infection prevalence um, in those tick species. And finally, hosts are really important. And they fill a variety of roles. And so hosts, most importantly for the tick, are food. They're going to provide a blood meal. There also can be a reservoir for pathogens, and it completely depends which pathogen you're looking at, which reservoir host is important or hosts. They're also really important for local and long distance dispersal. So if you think about ticks, they feed for a, a pretty long time, particularly the tick species we're looking at. And so they're feeding from a couple days to a couple weeks if you're an adult female. And so if you decide to hitchhike on a wildlife species, you can move pretty far in that amount of time depending on you know, the home range and the activity pattern and the season for that host species. And not all hosts are created equal. So the, that relates to all of those different factors. And some hosts, they don't really care if a tick's feeding on them. They're pretty permissive. They will happily carry around lots of ticks and not pick them off. And then there's some species that absolutely hate having ticks on them, will actively pick them off. Um, opossums are one of those species. And so some of them are, are good hosts and others are not so great. And just as we've talked about climate and habitat changes, and we get into this sort of big messy picture, we have host changes that are occurring as well. Because of climate change, because of habitat change, and we have other anthropogenic related factors, right? We have massive impacts on our wildlife population for a variety of different reasons. And all of these host changes, either positive or negative, will impact that whole ecological system. And I put this up here. So I'm a veterinarian and so I think about the patient considerations as well. We could replace 
this really cute dog with a human face if you're thinking more about human patient considerations or whichever um, host you're worried about becoming infected with disease. And then we tie in a bunch of other factors. So we have the tick considerations, the disease considerations, but let's say you had a tick there and it had a pathogen in it. It doesn't really pose a risk unless it's feeding on something that's susceptible. And for that to happen, there needs to be an overlap between that host's behavior and the tick's environment. And so if we're thinking about our furry dog friends, are they going out into tick habitat? And that tick habitat's gonna vary by the species you're looking at. Do they have contact with wildlife species? So we have some tick species that predominantly reside around nests or where the wildlife are. And so only animals that are actually going into those nests, so maybe a hound that's out hunting and found a groundhog and is sticking its head into a groundhog nest might be more likely to come in contact with groundhog ticks versus a dog that only walks on a sidewalk in the city is probably never gonna see a groundhog tick. Any travel. And travel is important not only thinking about long distance travel, so if you took your dog on a vacation to Europe, but local travel because if we think about the risks in say downtown Toronto where you're only on a sidewalk and your natural habitat and tick habitat is pretty limited, but if you decide to go up to the Muskokas for a weekend with your dog, that very much changes what exposure that animal could be exposed to. And that's more local travel, right? You don't necessarily think hopping in the car for an hour is really travel. Season is important to consider because every tick species has seasonal fluctuations when they're active. And then knowing if you engage in any preventative behavior. And so we talk about that a lot when we think about COVID, right? What preventative behaviors you're engaging with that might change your risk profile. It's the same with ticks and tick-borne diseases. We don't have as many things in our arsenals, especially if we're thinking about people, but certainly tick checks and um, you know, covering up, staying out of tick habitat are all important preventative behaviors that can reduce your risk. So hopefully I illustrated at least a little bit of this messy, complex system that we're thinking about and some of the interconnections that you might be able to start to see when we're thinking about One Health. And, you know, I kind of label ticks and tick-borne diseases as a great poster child for a One Health approach um, because it has all of those components and we really can't understand the system and make a difference unless we use a One Health approach. So I have this basic diagram up here where, you know, if we were just thinking about the tick and the bacteria and where it's being transmitted, we might, you know, focus a little bit on the tick and um, white-footed mice are a reservoir for some tick-borne diseases. And then if there's exposure to people or animals. But if we really only focus on the bacteria and on the level of the tick and a little bit on the host, we're going to miss a lot of that big picture. And so we might miss all the environmental factors that we need to think about, other host populations that have roles, all of the behavioral factors that occur um, with people and animals and our interactions with, with the environment. So that really is what makes it a big messy system and the reason we need a One Health approach. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to sort of our example or case study, which is the black-legged tick and Lyme disease. And I'm gonna kind of mirror um, many of the aspects that I just introduced, but provide some specific examples. So maybe you've seen these guys before. So we have this, the black-legged tick is a three-host tick. The baby tick, the larva has six legs. It's like a pin dot. You're probably not gonna see them very easily. Um, the nymph is about the size of a sesame seed, very small, uh, recognizable because it has eight legs. And then this is the adult male and adult female. And we are actually, it's October 5th, 6th, it's the 5th. These guys are hungry right now. And so if you're going out for your Thanksgiving Day walk, cover up, do your tick checks, um, make sure that you're paying attention to that. And for your people, uh, sorry, not your people, your animals, um, your people as well, um, because this is actually peak adult time. Okay, 
So a, a really basic overview of Lyme disease, the causative agent is Borrelia burgdorferi, named after Willie Burgdorfer. I always kind of laugh at that. I was like, I don't know if I would want to be named after that, but um, it will be remembered in history forever. Our primary reservoir, so where the tick is going to pick up the bacteria and where it resides in nature, are small mammals, particularly white-footed mice. They're very good reservoirs. The vectors are nymphal and adult stages. So mum doesn't pass the bacteria to baby ticks, so the ticks have to acquire that bacteria when they take a blood meal. Our susceptible species are humans, as well as dogs and horses. So for transmission to occur for Borrelia burgdorferi, there's a specific set of conditions that you need. So it has to be a black-legged tick. We've got lots of tick species, but we know that black-legged ticks, so Exodes scapularis in eastern Canada and Exodes pacificus in western Canada, are competent reservoir or competent vectors. That tick needs to be infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. So not all ticks carry the bacteria, and that infection prevalence is going to vary based on your geographic area. So if you're sort of in, in, let's say, eastern Ontario, eastern Canada, infection prevalences can be quite high. In some focal areas, it can be over 50%. And so that way you're really thinking that your likelihood if the tick is infected is quite high. And it has to be attached for at least 24 hours. And this, this number is important too when we're thinking about prevention and activities like tick checks and removing ticks quickly. And so the 24 hours isn't an arbitrary um, number. It's based on looking at the bacteria actually resides in the gut of the tick. It has to change all its proteins and then migrate up into the salivary glands and then it's essentially spit out into the bloodstream of whoever it's feeding on. And so that process takes about 24 hours. If we're thinking about canine Lyme disease, it, there's a different profile that we see in canine Lyme disease versus human Lyme disease. So canine Lyme disease, generally, we kind of think of as a more chronic disease. It appears three to five months later after a tick bite. The vast majority of dogs will seroconvert, meaning they've been exposed, but they don't become sick. So that's really good. It creates a whole bunch of complications with diagnosis and treatment in veterinary medicine, and we can talk a lot more about that later. And the most common signs are your dog just isn't doing right. Fever, anorexia, lethargy. But the really characteristic sign is a shifting lameness. So your dog's running along, or well, if it's lethargic, maybe it's not running along, but its, leg, its front leg hurts one day and then its back leg hurts the other day and its front leg is fine. That's kind of weird, but it's very characteristic that we see in Lyme disease. And then we have this super scary aspect of canine Lyme disease where less than 1% to 2% actually develop kidney failure. Um, and we, we still don't fully understand that. And it's very difficult for us to study in a lab environment to really understand the pathophysiology. Some literature does say that there might be breed preferences, but um, we still have a lot of unknowns. This is a bit of an older map, but things it sort of it shows the patterns that um, have been consistent, and so we can see areas of um, this is for zero prevalence. So we can't equate that to disease. Zero prevalence just essentially means that you have antibodies, and so you've been exposed at some point in time. And so we see higher levels of exposure in eastern Canada, so particularly eastern Ontario, and then out into the maritime provinces and in southern Quebec, and then as well as uh, southeastern Manitoba. And so those are kind of the hot spots, and we recognize that because we know we have thriving tick populations in that area. We can look a little bit about the human side. I'm a veterinarian, so I'm not a human expert. Um, but the difference is, is that humans will actually show an acute disease. So quite soon after they've been infected by a tick, um, so 10 to 14 days, they might not feel super great, have a fever, sort of like a, a summer flu is what it's equated to. You can get better from that without treatment, as in like you just sort of feel okay and then you don't go to the doctor. 
But the problem is, is that if you don't get treated in the acute stage, it can kind of progress into disseminated and then um, late where you have the neurological, rheumatological, um, and cardiac signs that are recognized as being quite serious and debilitating in people. You see this bullseye rash up here, which has gotten its, its erythema migrans, characteristic of borrelia burgdorferi infection, which is great if you see it. So it's believed about 60 to 80% of people that are bitten by an infected tick will develop that. But if your tick bit you behind your ear or on your scalp or somewhere that you don't readily see, it's not particularly helpful. So, and in some cases, this can kind of be misdiagnosed. You know, it's the summertime, you're getting a whole bunch of bug bites. Maybe you're not realizing that that's what it looks like. You just think it's a, a skin rash. And on the flip side, where we're saying that most dogs don't become clinical, most people do become clinical. And why we're concerned? So Lyme disease became a reportable disease in 2009, meaning that physicians were reported to, or required to report cases. There's still under-reporting that occurs, but we can see this nice steady, well not nice, but we can see this trend of increasing case counts. The 2021 is um, preliminary data, so they haven't published their full data. Um, but again, we're seeing increase after increase with growing tick populations. So if we're thinking about what these patterns we're seeing and what's kind of driving that, we can look back to the ecology in this complex, messy system. So the black-legged tick has very um, specific temperature and humidity requirements. Cumulative degree days is a, a word used in entomology and vector-borne diseases to really look at how long the temperature is suitable for that um, insect species to reproduce and survive. And essentially, I, it's kind of a hard term to, to think about, but is it warm enough for long enough is essentially the question you have to ask. And as our temperatures have been increasing, that warm enough for long enough is becoming possible in areas where it wasn't previously. These ticks are also incredibly reliant on humidity. So anything over like less than 80% humidity, they're gonna start to dry out. And that's where they'll climb up. You've probably seen those pictures of them waiting for a host with their arms out. If it's too dry, they climb back down, they go into the leaf litter layer of the forest, they rehydrate, and they come back out. So if it's really, really dry, they can't quest for very long. And if you can't quest for very long, then you might not find a blood meal, and eventually you'll starve. There's been lots of research that, have looked, that has looked at climate change and the impact of climate change on the black-legged tick. And essentially, we know and we have ongoing research, and I'm going to show you some of our fieldwork uh, data shortly, where we just keep seeing these populations creep northward. So the black-legged tick, there's a population of black-legged ticks at Long Point, Ontario, that we believe there is probably, was probably there for 100 years. So it's been in Ontario. It's been in the last uh, decade, two decades, that we've really seen this creep northward. And there's a few things that are going on and driving that. But certainly climate change and climate being suitable, so our summer is getting longer, and the tick being able to feed, develop, feed again without starving, so a good period that supports its activity, is now being seen in areas where it previously wasn't suitable. The black-legged tick is a forest-dwelling tick, so it, pr it needs some sort of forest cover, leaf litter layer, and understory, that's related to a number of different factors. So if we think about this tick needing a lot of humidity to survive, this is where it has that nice humid environment and that nice leaf litter layer um, to go back down and rehydrate. The leaf litter layer is also where it spends the winter. So it climbs down, there's a nice insulating snow layer. I've heard time and time and again people being like, oh, it's a cold winter, it's gonna kill off the tick populations. And I'm like, ah, not so lucky. They're happy, they're down in the leaf litter layer. What we're really looking at, if you had a really, really long winter, 
where ticks couldn't come out and feed and have a summer where they could develop, that's a bigger risk than a cold, like normal duration winter. The understory makes this nice habitat where hosts are gonna be, so um, wild animals, and it's also something that it can climb up on and quest and wait for a host. We have sort of three categories of hosts for black-legged ticks. Small migratory birds, small mammals, and white-tailed deer. And they each have a different role. So our small migratory birds are really important when we're thinking about distribution of the tick. And I'm going to show you a map in a second. Small mammals are important. They're the preferred host for um, the sub-adult uh, life stages, so the larva and the nymphs. And they're also really important reservoirs if we're thinking about Borrelia burgdorferi and some other tick-borne pathogens. The white-tailed deer is not responsible for any transmission of Borrelia burgdorferi. It always gets a really bad name in Lyme disease. But the reason is, is because adult ticks love to feed on white-tailed deer. The adult female can take a really big blood meal so she can grow all her eggs. And so we generally see really good um, black-legged tick populations, high abundance associated with high white-tailed deer populations. And then you add in all the other ingredients and generally have a high Lyme disease prevalence. So if we're thinking in the context of climate change, if the climate's getting warmer but there's no ticks there, ticks have to have a way to get there. And so we've known, we've known this for, for a long time, that ticks are great hitchhikers and there's lots of ticks that are brought up on migratory birds every year. So that's not a new phenomenon and it's certainly not something that's um, Climate change is impacting bird migration, but this has been going on for centuries. But if we think about every year, now the estimate is like millions and millions of ticks every year being introduced. If over time, they're now being introduced into forested habitats that have a climate that's suitable for them, there's lots of little seeds that are being planted for these new populations. And so that's the process that we've seen happening over time as climate change is making places more suitable for these tick populations. What am I doing for time? Okay. Um, so the range of the black-legged tick, as I said, has been expanding. And we've been following certain areas in Ontario for quite a while, and it's, it's interesting and scary to see some of these tick populations expand. Now we talked about Lyme disease, but this is relevant not only for Lyme disease because the black-legged tick is a vector for other pathogens as well. We think mostly of Lyme disease because the infection prevalence in these ticks for Borrelia burgdorferi is much higher than any other pathogen. But we can't forget about these ones. So Anaplasma phagocytophilum causes anaplasmosis. People, dogs, cats, horses are susceptible. Generally, we see this in most of the surveillance efforts in Canada, like under 1% to 2%. And so we really rarely see clinical disease associated with that. But we think that might be starting to change. The bottom three are human-associated pathogens. So there are animal reservoirs, but we don't find that our animal population gets sick. And we see these, again, in much lower infection prevalence. But something that we keep monitoring, because even in the United States, there's been early evidence that things are changing. And so it's not to say that things can't change in our tick population. Powassan virus is one that's of particular interest from a public health perspective, because even though we rarely see cases, the cases that we see are really bad. And so Powassan virus can cause a fatal encephalitis. Um, it's been around for many, many years. It was first diagnosed in Powassan, Ontario, which is this little town up sort of south of North Bay. But in that case, it was a fatal encephalitis in a child. And we've had, even over the last few years, um, other fatal cases. And it's also incredibly hard to study because we rarely find it. And so understanding those disease patterns is still a little bit of a mystery. So we've been conducting field surveillance across Ontario since the mid-2010s. And we're seeing consistent patterns 
um, particularly, there's a lot going on in this map, um, but the stars are representing tick populations and Borrelia burgdorferi. And so Eastern Ontario has really been highlighted as a hot spot where we're conducting lots of active surveillance, so going out and doing tick drags and finding thriving populations of black-legged ticks. In 2016, we looked at some focal areas and conducted surveillance over a one-year time frame to see if anything was changing even in that short period of time. And so there were sites that we had visited the previous year where we didn't find any ticks. And so active surveillance, um, you can have false negatives when the tick population is quite, um, like the abundance is really low. But we didn't find anything at those sites. So either there weren't any ticks or the populations were very, very low. And then the next year, in these triangle, the red triangles, that line, we see that we detect tick populations at all of those sites. And so whether some of those are introduced ticks, that's, that's a possibility. But we're seeing that expansion and that range expansion even on a small local level in eastern Ontario. And we built on this work ongoing in 2019 up to 2020, or sorry, 2017 up to 2019. Get my years confused. So again, there's lots going on on this map, dots and all these sort of things. The red dots are positive ticks, so ticks with Borrelia burgdorferi. But the orange sites are, the orange dots are Borrelia, um, Ixodes scapularis. No Borrelia burgdorferi, but generally what we find over surveillance is the ticks there, and then after time we detect the bacteria. And so, if I go back to this map, in this area we see all these white circles. So those are the sites that we visited and we're not finding any ticks. And so that's from 2014, 2015. But then we zoom ahead about five years and now we're seeing all these tick populations or sites where there's ticks here. Which is, we had already isolated that Eastern Ontario was important for us to watch in a hot spot. And we do continue to see there's all those orange sites there. But something's now changing in Central Ontario, sort of north of Toronto. And really what we've been able to see is that there are sort of expanding hotspots and two areas of Ontario that really need to be paid attention to. And certainly that's Eastern Ontario and then that's sort of north of Toronto, Central Ontario. And this is really relevant too if we're thinking about human exposure. And so certainly this area is incredibly populated. It's cottage country, there's lots of cities, parks, areas where people and animals can be exposed. And Eastern Ontario, also Ottawa Valley, there's quite a lot of people and animals there, and it's another big area for outdoor activities. So we've continued to build on this in Canada Lyme disease has become a really important research priority because we see growing case counts in people. Um, it can be associated with debilitating disease. There's been a lot of advocacy from the patient community about better access to testing and treatment. And so the Canadian Lyme Disease Research Network was formed in the last four or five years. I'm going to forget my date now. Um, which is, I think, a really great example of a One Health approach. So this network, there's over 100 researchers, clinicians, veterinarians, patients, family members that are all part of this network. And it's de designed to address many knowledge gaps in Lyme disease research. So the first one being diagnostics and a big call for improved diagnostics for Lyme disease in Canada. Prevention and risk reduction, clinical science, and then that education and knowledge translation piece. So thinking about all healthcare providers and people in Canada, how can we reduce our risks 
how can we recognize the disease faster, and how can we support patients. So I'm lucky enough to be a member of this research network. It's a really great place for knowledge exchange and um, research to occur. And most of the work is in prevention and risk reduction. And so that's where a lot of the surveillance activities happen. And so with the advent of the Canadian Lyme Disease Research Network came the Canadian Lyme Sentinel Network. There's all these acronyms, or CALSEN. Um, and the goal of CALSEN was to establish a network of areas or sentinel regions across the country that there would be long-term monitoring of tick populations, bacteria, and clinical disease so that all of those puzzle pieces could go back together. And that we'd have longitudinal data because sometimes, you know, with surveillance, you might get funding to do a little bit for a couple years and then maybe nothing afterwards. And so being able to follow things and understand trends and ecology and epidemiology becomes very challenging when you only have little pieces of information. And so the initial goal when this got set up was to have at least one region per province. And these regions were selected by a multi-criteria decision analysis process where essentially many stakeholders got together and said, what are our priorities for choosing sentinel areas? And the things that came out as being particularly important were population density, because you have that element of people being at risk and exposure. Suitable habitat, so you need something to support the tick. Logistics, so ideally people need to be able to get there and you have to afford to be able to get there and access sites to do the surveillance. And those were kind of, those are the main elements that, that drove this. Oh, and also passive surveillance. So where were ticks being found by the public or on animals to sort of provide that early signal that maybe we need to go out and do more field surveillance to understand what's going on in the tick population. And so this was the first report that was published from field surveillance that happened in 2019. 2020 didn't happen because we had a pandemic. And then since then, we've had two additional years of surveillance. And so in Ontario, we started out first with a sentinel region around Hamilton, Guelph, so this area, um, one around Kingston, and one around Ottawa. And the, what we know about these areas is actually quite different. And so Ottawa and Kingston, we know that in eastern Ontario, it's a higher risk area. But we don't want to stop monitoring the higher risk areas because we can get a lot of data from there. We can understand what's happening in the human and animal population. And those are also places where we might see other pathogens start to emerge. So we certainly want to keep monitoring those tick populations. We also want to monitor areas where things haven't happened, but we think they might for a variety of reasons. And so that's why Guelph and Hamilton was selected. And through this, all of the ticks get collected. This is sort of a messy tape, or sorry, all the ticks get tested. Um, and this is what we see in, in Ontario from the first year. So fortunately, where we live around here, we're not seeing too much. That's changing though, this is from 2019. And then the Kingston and the Ottawa Gatineau areas being high risk. And if you remember, if you go back to those range expansion uh, maps, that's where we're seeing big changes starting to happen was in eastern Ontario. Before I move on to the, the next slide, so fortunately we've been able to expand our Sentinel network um, by double over the last couple of years. And so Ontario remains like we still have Hamilton, Kingston, Ottawa, Gatineau. There's now a Sentinel region around London, one around Peterborough, one around the Muskokas, and another one around Sault Ste. Marie, which is exciting, except when you have to go out and do all that field work. Um, oh, and we also have one around Thunder Bay, which is important because there's pockets also in north um, western Ontario, near the Manitoba border, so that allows um, another area to be monitored. So there's things we can learn um, from field surveillance that have relevance when we're thinking about human risk, animal risk, um, and understanding sort of the ecology and what's happening. There's also other types of surveillance, um, particularly doing um, 
surveillance through companion animals that can provide not only information about what's going on in our domestic animal population, but early warning signs for things that might impact our human population. And so that really is where that One Health approach comes in, is being able to share that knowledge because that information has repercussions and implications to both populations. And so in 2019 to 2020, we did a big tick surveillance, uh, tick surveillance initiative across Canada where we just asked um, a whole bunch of clinics to send in all the ticks that came in off of pets for a year which might have been kind of crazy for the amount of ticks we got, uh, which was ultimately successful. And we had some really interesting findings that I think uh, align with some of the patterns we're seeing and also might be foreshadowing things that are changing in the future. And so on this graph, the size of the circle represents the number of ticks that were submitted from that area. So if we're thinking about epidemiology and sample sizes, we know that the bigger the circle, the more reliable the infection prevalence estimate because you have a bigger sample size to make that estimate from. And so, you know, a small little dot like this that's bright red, if there's only two ticks and one was positive, your 50% infection prevalence is not particularly reliable. But if we look at big things like this that are based off of like 100 ticks, that's a much more reliable infection prevalence. So we do see the darker reds and oranges and bigger circles in eastern Ontario. But, again, we're starting to see what was coming up in field surveillance, where that area sort of north of Toronto, we're seeing more and more ticks being submitted, and the infection prevalence not as high, so we're at about 10 to 20 percent in this area, except that circle, but growing. And so that early risk uh, warning. The other thing that I think is particularly interesting, so there's been rumbles in the scientific community that things may be changing with anaplasmosis in eastern Ontario. And so in our study, again, we got a lot of ticks from eastern Ontario, we're starting to see a little bit higher infection prevalence. So it's certainly not, you know, the 50% that we're seeing with Borrelia burgdorferi, but it's not the 1% that initially we thought was in our tick population. And so this is where education becomes really important. If we're talking to veterinarians, you should be on the lookout that maybe some of these um, animals that are presenting could have anaplasmosis or co-infections. So ticks feed on a bunch of things. Maybe they don't just have Lyme disease, but they have anaplasmosis as well. And also with patient education. So those differentials need to be on the, the list if someone's in tick area. A lot of tick-borne diseases present with sort of non-specific signs initially, and so not blowing that off, just thinking it's the flu, but thinking about um, what type of exposure might have occurred. And then something that we're looking at doing, which I think really aligns with the One Health approach, is tying those pieces together. So I introduced the Canadian um, Lyme Sentinel Network, where it's predominantly going out and doing field sampling, testing those ticks, looking at environmental variables. There's future plans to be able to get human case data because it's a reportable disease and look at those areas with longitudinal data. But we also need the veterinary piece. And that is really where the One Health approach comes in. And so in last fall and then this spring, um, a pilot project was conducted across the Sentinel regions in Ontario asking veterinarians to submit ticks off of companion animals and also serological test data looking at exposure. And what we plan to do is compare that with field data to really understand what patterns are going on and understand how we might use different types of data as early warning signals and integrate them together to better understand what's going on, to direct education, um, preventative measures, etc. So it's really adding to that fulsome piece of information. And this, although I have this on my slide, is being driven by Cyril Aquo in my lab, a PhD candidate who many of you know. And so those are a few little pieces. I think I'm, oh, I'm right on time. Um, but I, I welcome questions. It's a very complex 
there's lots going on in this space, but hopefully um, I was able to illustrate some of those important aspects of a One Health approach, um, but there's lots more that we can talk about as well.